roses. Roses are the largest selling cut flower in the United States. And the red rose is the top color in the United States and Japan. No surprise there. In Europe, less than 40% of the roses sold are red. Most, ever, most women want something else. Women, when do you buy roses? Do you buy them for gifts? Yeah. <coughs> women typically don't buy roses. They typically don't. So it's mostly men, mostly as gifts, mostly as uh, panic. <laughs> So that's just the way it is. So, um, Lots of interest in bicolors, um, a lot of interest in flower fragrance, because a lot of the modern cultivars, because we've been working so hard on the size of the bloom, the color of the bloom, and the longevity and the vase life of the bloom, that flower fragrance kind of got left out. Production of roses in the United States originally was limited to the northeastern region, just like carnations, uh, primarily on Long Island. Um, with transportation, environmental control, uh, production is expanded across the country. A cut rose is very easy to transport, uh, and it has uh, production has moved offshore, just like carnations and chrysanthemums. Roses have a cropping time of about 70 days uh, from its uh, pruning, um, and they can do it and do propagation 70 days in South America, uh, in Colombia, and in Ecuador um, with no heat. And actually those cool, cold greenhouses produce huge blooms. And actually the premium blooms are mostly coming out of Ecuador these days. Uh, United States is 35 to 40 days, but we're heating our greenhouses. And the Canadians and uh, the, the Dutch, their rose production, uh, they're even further high, higher in, in latitude than we are here in the United States, have to do supplemental light and also have to do carbon dioxide enrichment. What's driving the competition from South America is a good rose climate, large labor supply, and low wages, of course. But those rose growers are generating a lot of hard currency for their, um, their workers. Cut rose is from the genus Rosa. You'll see th words like Rosa hybrida and stuff like this. And actually, Rosa hybrida is a misnomer. It's a hybrid rose. Rosa ex hybrida taxonomically really doesn't exist. We break roses up into what we call long stem standards or short stem standards. In the industry, we use the technical term shorty. Uh, sweethearts are the small flowered uh, roses. And then, of course, we've got the outdoor and outdoor roses, which include the hybrid teas, the Antigua, Floribunda, and Grandiflora roses. All of the cut roses grown in the greenhouse are hybrid teas. That's where they're categorized. There's about 10,000 or more than 10,000 cultivars that have been developed over the centuries. Um, Breeding programs, the, bre the, the, the rose breeders primarily on, uh, in Europe and France, they're looking at disease resistance, powdery mildew. Uh, for the, a lot of the shrub rose breeding programs, are working on black spot resistance and botrytis resistant on the blooms themselves. Other things they look at is insect and spider mite resistance, which doesn't seem to work. Um, they're looking for floriferousness of the blooms. In other words, um, ever blooming, constant blooming, uh, floriferousness over large uh, diversity of um, climate conditions, uh, cold, warm, photoperiod insensitive, such as that. They're looking at flower form, color, and fragrance. Um, if you go to rose shows with the, where the florists go to, Every year, they seem to have 15 or 20 new cultivars or new flower forms, new fragrances, such as that. Um, looking at stem strength and length, the longer the stem, the more value. And of course, post-harvest characteristics, how long does it last in the vase? And cold hardiness, heat resistance in the greenhouse. Vase life is pretty important. Seems like uh, a lot of florists typically seem to forget about vase life, though. 
We only grow roses from seed for breeding. Roses are uh, vegetatively propagated. It's a woody shrub. Therefore, uh, for woody shrub, all the vegetative propagation is mainly done as a tea bud. And those of you who had plant propagation, I'll show you a picture of a tea bud, and that's as much as we'll do. The root stocks for the tea buds on, on uh, greenhouse roses are the root stocks are selected primarily for plant vigor and disease resistance. Most of the roses that we use in the United States are on a Manetti hybrid uh, rose stock. If you were to grow the Manetti hybrid rose stock, it's got little dinky little yellow flowers that don't look like much. Um, and they look probably more like what you'd see in the woods rose, which is native up in the mountains here. Uh, in Europe, they use the R Rosa canina or Rosa indica. That's what's primarily used in Europe and in Israel. If you were to bring in Israeli cultivars, uh, which is what a lot of the uh, growers use in South America and Central America, it's going to be on more likely indica. The budding of roses, um, it's an industry in itself to propagate roses. It's either done either in Canada, Arizona, or Texas. Like for instance, the shrub roses or the, the garden roses we get in Colorado come mostly out of the Tyler, Texas area. They're all tea budded. They're all budded, budded roses, grafted and budded. Um, and they have to have a low area of low fall harvest. We're not going to go too much into the harvest schedule and production schedule of roses. Uh, we'll leave that for Dr. Clett in nursery management. So the tea bud, the tea bud, or some people call it the shield bud, where we take a dormant cyan wood, take out the bud. And inside, inside the um, inner side, we, the, the cambial layer then, we slip it into a, a T-shaped cut into the understock. The understock has to be veg, uh, vigorously growing at the time. The, the cyan wood has to be dormant. But we need this vigorously growing so we can actually slip and slip the bark back so the cambial layer is active. And then, of course, and you guys, uh, I know that Dr. Hughes teaches tea budding in plant propagation, so we won't go into that. For production of stock plant material, for uh, the first year in October, they do the planting, prep, bed preparation, and they'll put unrooted uh, root stock material that's been uh, certified to be virus free. Um, they'll cut the canes into even lengths and then they will put those in the field. And those cuttings are established in the Texas area, for instance, or in Oregon or Canada in uh, October um, through December. And during that cooler season of the year, that's when you get the active rooting into the ground. So we're planting directly into the field. After the after it's gone through the winter season and the uh, bud material is coming up, of course, you're going to harvest the bud material for your um, uh, cyan material to get your desired cultivars. And you're going to put those in the cooler and store them. And you're going to do your tea budding during the early spring. And then after the tea, bu tea bud takes about three weeks, which is usually end of May, early June, um, they'll come in and snap off the top of the actively growing understock to force carbohydrates to go into the bud and force the bud growth. And then eventually they'll prune it out. They do the summer production. Fall is when they're harvested, graded, and chipped out. So as a consequence, we're pretty much for buying budded roses, because you're going to buy them as dormant bare root material, you're pretty much limited to being able to only buy uh, your, your bud, your your rose plants in, in the fall. Some other practices that are used, um, a chip bud. Uh, what's a uh, chip bud or is being um, more and more uh, used where we take both dormant um, rootstock and dormant cyan wood and just carve, carve out a little chip bud and place it in, wrap it up, and then they'll root and, sh and force the bud at the same time. And this is what's used there, um, 
for hydroponics. For instance, these are newly planted chip budded plants in a hydroponic trough. Um, they don't produce as quickly in the greenhouse mature plants, mature blooms, because in, in a standard tea bud that's gone through the standard nursery practices, we can get blooms off of it in the first season. These take two seasons to establish before you get active uh, flower buds on it. But they're a lot cheaper and you can get them on a lot faster this way. And it's called a chip bud. Roses have a lot of uh, characteristics. This is a woody plant. Uh, a lot of people think of roses with thorns. Roses do not have thorns. Okay, roses do not have thorns. Who's taking plant ID? Okay, what is a thorn? On the outer layer of the bark. Outer layer of the bark. It's an epidermal trichome is what it is, the modified structure of a trichome. So roses have what's in fact called a prickle. So when somebody says that this rose is really thorny, they said, no, it's prickly. One of the questions I had in my PhD examination when I was fin finishing up my work is, what's the difference between a thorn, a prickle, and a spine? Anybody know those differences? What's the difference between a thorn, a prickle, and a spine? If you've had Dr. Whiting's, Professor Whiting's introduction to horticulture, you should be able to answer this question. Because I know he teaches it. What is a thorn? What part of the tissue of a plant is a thorn arrive from, arise from? What's that? The woody part, it's part of the vascular tissue. Okay, the woody part. A spine, what plants have spines? Cacti, and the spine is from, it's a modified leaf, it's actually a leaf. The prickle is modified epidermal tail. Okay, so you, that's one of the reasons that we can flick the prickles off of a rose very easily, and in fact we have um, devices that actually strip the roses because it's kind of hard to handle. And here's a, a, a cross section of a, um, of a rose prickle, and you can see that it has no vascular attachment. That's why we can flick them off. Okay, so flowers uh, for roses, we can start to see the flower bud about two weeks after the axillary uh, growth starts to begin. And not all flower buds will develop to maturity. It's based upon light, CO2, and temperature and nutrition. And you can see that the uh, flower bud itself has a um, axillary buds are pointed and close to the base are more rounded. And we look at five leaflet leaves and the five leaflet leaves will generate rosebuds, rose blooms faster. And we see this, the flower bud development um, is in relationship to light and photosynthesis. Um, if we bump up the CO2 level with roses, we uh, can give better uh, flower bud production. And what happens when we have low light and low CO2 is we get a formation of a, of a symptom called blind shoots. And what a blind shoot is, just a shoot that's putting out a stem that has no flower on it. And what the growers will do is they'll come in and they'll be constantly cutting out blind shoots because that blind shoot is just vegetative development that doesn't end up in a, um, um, has no bloom, so it's of no value. So by adding supplemental lighting, which the northern growers do in Canada and Holland, they will add supplemental light. Now these are perennial crops. Typically, the lifespan of a rose in a greenhouse, and this is an old greenhouse that was in Colorado shortly after I moved here. Typically, roses are, are grown in the greenhouse eight to 10 years. And what they do is they'll typically want to put in a rotation schedule of taking out roses 
to renovate their crop, to keep the crop vigorous, but also to stay up to date with modern cultivars. Okay? So when you choose to plant roses, you need to focus on getting the good quality cultivars that are going to grow well for you and you're going to be able to market well and spend some time and effort on developing your soil preparation. Most roses in the world are traditionally grown in the ground in raised beds with about eight, eight inches of modified soil. Uh, it's got to be deep because if it's uh, shallow it's not going to have enough oxygen. Um, and two parts sandy loam, one part organic matter, coarse aggregate, pH of 5.5 to 6.3. That's the standard. Um, those that are still growing in the roses in the United States are primarily doing it hydroponically. Poor aeration, cold soil, soil compaction, you're going to have chlorotic growth, short stems, and of course, uh, whenever we plant our roses, they're going to be either be steam pasteurized or treated with methyl bromide. Most of the roses grown in the United States are grown hydroponically. Those people that are still growing roses, uh, primarily on the west coast, uh, either using rock wool or core. And these are hydro hydroponic beds um, where the, the hydroponic beds are raised up about waist high. When we let roses grow naturally in a bed, they're probably, by the time we're harvesting, they could be six, eight feet off the ground, and somebody harvesting roses six to eight feet off the ground either has to walk on drywall stilts or there has to be a frame that they use to harvest. Uh, the hydroponic production, we're using a tactic called bending, and uh, where we've got a nutrient trough and we're managing the nutrient system pretty accurately. Matthew. Like a undercurrent. 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 It's not ebb and flood. It's not an NFT system. It's a it's a substrate system. The roots are growing in a substrate. Okay. Uh, planting. You plant them based upon when the uh, budded plants are available, which is typically in late fall. Um, we prefer to plant after holidays. So what a what a rose grower will do is they'll typically get in there their rose plants in late fall and they'll put them in the cooler and store them until after Valentine's Day because they don't want to disrupt their, because that's when you were getting the premium value for our roses uh, on those Valentine's Day shipments. And um, it's kind of a compromise. Uh, like I said, they're not harvested until late fall and uh, after transplant, uh, the best thing they can do is to, what they'll do, a lot of growers will do is they use a bread sack, put it over the plants to, to push them a little harder, um, add supplemental light, and the, the bread sack is, is more effective in stimulating early rose growth uh, than like a, a polyethylene Ziploc bag or something like that because a bread sack is actually polyethylene, whereas Ziploc bags and the sandwich bags are polypropylene, and the polyethylene actually has some ability to exchange some air, which is why you don't store your onions in an old bread sack in the refrigerator. Planting um, after Christmas or Valentine's Day, uh, you know, you're, you're maintaining your, your best um, production um, in the winter. It's easier to plant, light levels are low, and you're not going to be stressing. So there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to whichever system you use. Most people do most of their planting after Mother's Day, though, because Mother's Day still is a production cycle. Um, advantage, you keep your plants all year long, but you're planting in late spring, your weather is unpredictable, and oftentimes you're running into issues with um, heat in the greenhouse. Most growers avoid planting their crops in the summertime because it's hot. Um, but on the other hand, if we're digging up our plants and changing them out in the summertime, our plants have the lowest value. Right now, in, in the July and August, roses capture the lowest um, value. 
it's after the wedding season. Um, if you want to buy good cheap roses, I mean, you can get them for nickels versus nickels a piece, nickel a piece versus dollars a piece uh, in the regular <laughs> production season, the winter months. Okay, so January 1 is flowers for Easter, February 20 flowers for Mother's Day. If we plant them too deep, um, one of the things that you need to remember when you're planting is since it's a budded material, you want to make sure that you never plant the, 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 the tea bud, the bud union beneath the soil, or the bud union itself will root. And oftentimes the cyan material, the top part of the plant, does not have vigorous rooting characteristics and will sometimes stunt the plant. Uh, pl planting them, uh, one plant per square foot. Uh, typically we use three rows because uh, at anything more than that will give, us, give the grower a hard time reaching into the crop and there's nothing worse than falling into a crop of thorny roses. Prickles. Prickles. Very good. New plants come in as budded plants. Um, we can store them just at freezing. You want to make, one of the first things you do when you get your budded plants in is you check them for broken roots, broken stems, trim that off. And a lot of propagators will ship in either shingle toe, which is shredded, uh, shredded cedar, or some kind of a moss, or they'll be dipped in wax. They have to have good roots for plant establishment and all the energy you need is in stored reserves and you want to shade the plants during transplant and use a mist to keep them from drying out too much in the greenhouse. When you plant your newly planted rose uh, bushes you want to make sure that you uh, start building the plant. Um, we're not going to allow them to flower at first. We want to start building them so we're going to pinch and remove the flower buds to encourage more vigorous branching. We want to spend time with our young plants building the architecture of the plant, especially for keeping that plant for eight, three to eight years. The architecture during the early stages is important. Um, pinching to do short compact plants with stout shoots and lots of breaks from the bottom. Pinching practices, uh, we have what's called a soft pinch. Soft pinch where we're just taking out the flower bud. Hard pinch is where we're taking out the first uh, trifoliate leaf. Soft pinch, we're not taking any, we're taking out young leaves, but a hard pinch is the first trifoliate leaf, but above the first five leaflet leaf. These are compound leaves, and the first, the, the leaflets that are right at the flower bud will only have three, and as they mature, they'll have five. And it depends a lot on uh, season. The soft pinch is quicker breaks, but not as many. I mean, it's going to break faster. So if you need to generate flowers faster, you're going to use a soft pinch. If you're breaking, uh, building plant architecture, and you're working for uh, getting a structure and you don't have to get flowers off right away off this crop, you'll use a hard pinch. But the soft pinch is going to give you faster flower, but it's going to be fewer. Um, unlike uh, carnations and chrysanthemums where we break the stem, um, these we have to use a knife or shears. So the knives have to be cleaned, they have to be sharp, uh, sanitation. Um, most growers will do their pinching twice before they start allowing them to bloom. And um, some growers what they'll do is they'll balance out to where they're only soft pinching some of the plant, hard pinching some of the plant to generate maybe a bloom crop off that newly transplanted material while building architecture. The greater the pinches, the larger the plant, but it's the larger time that it takes to get to a flowering plant. Now originally, growers would use stakes to uh, stake their plant, but now most everybody are, are using layers of uh, wiring. Uh, wires every 12 to 16 inches apart. Um, 
they'll go ahead and, and mount the wiring in the greenhouse permanently. They won't drag it up through the crop because that strips too much of the foliage, um, too much damage, which means that the growers have to be constantly in there tucking the bloom into the wiring to make sure we get long straight stems. Yield and cultivar is based upon the genetics, of course the environment, and it's all based on temperature, light, CO2. So warmer temperature, higher light, higher CO2 levels will give us the fastest bloom cycle. We can increase uh, axillary bud break uh, with higher growth rates, uh, higher leaf unfolding rates, but under low light or too high of a temperature, uh, low light, high temperature, we're going to have more blind shoots. The quality of flowers is not going to be as, as good. They'll be smaller at higher temperatures, even though we're getting faster production. That's why the Ecuadorian uh, roses have the big, huge flower buds, because they're being produced at a colder temperature, higher elevation, under s slower conditions. As the temperature gets up, we'll have reduced petals. The stem length will be short, and we won't have good quality of our flowers. If it's too low, temperatures are too low, we will have, again, an increased number of blind shoots because we're, the, the flower, the, the foliage is competing for photosynthates. So the optimum temperature for roses is night temperature 60 to 62, on cloudy days 64 to 72, on high sunny days 75 to 80. The optimum temperature, of course, is based upon the cultivar. Different cultivars have different optimum temperatures and CO2 levels. And if, so if you're going to have a high sunny light day and you're going to inject CO2, you can actually go up to greater than 80 to maybe 85 and still get good production. Light intensity, uh, increasing light to foot, 6,000 foot candles, which is the about the maximum light you're going to get in a greenhouse in the United States. Uh, Northern United States, um, Minnesota, and uh, where they have some production, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and over in Ontario, they use a lot of HID sodium lamps, um, actually 24 hours a day, um, if they can afford it. And we'll use shade cloth in the summer months just to keep the plants from blistering in the sun. Water. Um, most people use a, a drip, either drip tapes or surface tape or surface irrigation because roses, we want to keep the foliage dry um, to prevent disease problems. Carbon dioxide levels, 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million will give us uh, higher growth rates, bigger, bigger flower quality, sticker, thicker stems. And of course, we have to increase the light and temperature. And it will, addition of CO2 does reduce the number of blind shoots. If we're doing um, ventilation in our greenhouses, um, pad and pan cooling, um, we use that to, to replenish our CO2 levels, but unless we're injecting it. One of the things that growers, rose growers will do is they'll keep a lot of ventilation, use a lot of outside air in the greenhouses to reduce diseases. And they will heat their greenhouse and vent their greenhouse at the same time during the winter months, late in the afternoon, to prevent condensation on the foliage, which prevents powdery mildew. It takes the humidity out of the air. Plant nutrition. Um, since it's a perennial plant, um, they'll express a nutritional deficiency really fast, but it takes them a long time to get back into their uh, nutrients. So you have to manage your nutrition very closely, and a lot of rose growers are constantly taking leaflet samples, tissue samples, and sending them off to their media lab on a constant basis. So routine testing is required. And almost all rose growers will use constant feed to make sure the roses never go hungry. Uh, we're going to add nitrogen, potassium, magnesium, and iron. Uh, they're not necessarily a heavy feeder, 150 to 200 parts per million. 
I want to make sure in the summer months we use a um, nitrate to ammonium, five to one, uh, nit five parts nitrogen to one part ammonium. In the winter months when the soil temperatures are colder, it's even critical, more critical to avoid the ammonium in the nutritional system. Um, and if we're, if we're adding supplemental light, if we're lighting our crop with the HID lights, we need to use at least 300 parts per million nitrogen to keep the growth rate up. Planting directly in the soil, um, soil-based mixes um, need to make sure you have adequate potassium levels, about 150 parts per million, uh, primarily from potassium nitrate. Um, other fertilizer sources we use ammonium nitrate, calcium nitrate, ammonium sulfate. Boron is important uh, to prevent um, witch's broom because a, a, a rose plant can per generate little uh, witch's brooms on the end of their tissues, which is in addition to blind shoots, is, a, is gets to be a problem. And typically, unless you're doing uh, hydroponic production, soil production of roses, there's almost always enough phosphorus in the potting soil or in the topsoil, so it's very rarely added. Okay, 5.5 to 6.3. Roses are a day neutral crop. Um, they have what's called recurrent flowering. In other words, they, as long as the rose plant is, is actively growing, it's going to bloom, recurrently blooms. Uh, it's not dependent on photo period. It's not dependent upon um, temperature. They're initiated on every growing shoot after it gets up to a minimum size, unless it's going to be a blind shoot due to lack of uh, carbohydrates, and the floral differentiation core is right after the axillary bud has been released from apical dominance. In other words, once the axillary bud gets to about three, forms two to three five leaflet leaves, the apical meristem from the topmost growing plant, that apical dominance is, is, is shed, releasing that lateral shoot to bloom. And the transition from vegetative to reproductive Depending on the cultivar, depending on the temperature, it can be anywhere from 40 to 21, 4 to 21 days, typically about seven days for that apical dominance to be released. So if you want to keep your roses at home blooming constantly, you have to deadhead. Deadheading is critical for your garden roses. Hmm? Yeah. Axillary buds. Um, form flower buds uh, sooner. Um, speed is based upon how you harvest your plants. Um, flowers will initiate on all shoots, but sometimes they'll abort before you even see them. And the blinds, of course, just stop growing, and that's the ones that the growers will come in and har take out. We don't use any height control. Uh, we don't use plant growth regulators to keep height control because we want that long stem. Um, of course, how much pruning we do is going to adjust our heart, our pruning. Uh, a rose grower typically harvests roses twice a day at the minimum. They harvest roses in the morning and harvest roses in the afternoon. So they can get the rose at the peak bloom for the longest base life. And the rose growers were the first growers to get uh, a um, release from um, or a special waiver for restricted energy level, a restricted, inter, restricted entry access to a greenhouse after a pesticide has been applied so that they could harvest roses twice a day. And that took congressional legislation. Um, so a rose grower will send in, so the rose harvester, that worker that's harvesting the roses is actually licensed pesticide applicator because they're entering into greenhouse typically before the restricted entry interval is done. We typically harvest them at the tightest stage that a bud will open in water. Nobody likes to get a bullet or a bullhead in their flower vase. We've all seen bullheads in a flower vase. That's that flower bud that never opens. Okay, that means it was harvested too soon. Uh, harvesting it more open has better quality, but when we harvest those roses, they don't they have a tendency to not ship well. 
at what stage you harvest depends on um, a lot of things, depends on the market length, depends on the height of the plant season, um, but also, um, for instance, we have the calyx here in, in picture A, the calyx is upright. Picture B, you see that the, the, the uh, calyx is still upright and the flower bud is starting to swell. Picture C, we can start to see that the calyx is starting to reflex, starting to bend down. It's at the point where the calyx starts to reflex is when roses are typically harvested for most cultivars. Not all cultivars are the same. Uh, if it's harvested before the calyx is starting to reflex, like an A or B, that flower bud will not open in water and it'll become what's called a bullhead. In D, is uh, we see that 50% of the calyx is, is uh, started to reflex, and in E, the calyx is fully reflexed, and the guard petals, which is the first whorl of petals, is starting to open. E will give us the best quality in the vase, the best quality in the vase. However, C and D ship the best. Okay? So when you're harvesting, the rule of thumb is it's cut with a knife or shears, the first five leaf, leaf, leaf above the knuckle. Now what that means is that's the point of origin, the knuckle is the point of origin where that rose stem is broken off, the axillary shoot is broken off the main shoot. So we want to make sure that we leave that first five leaflet leaf above that knuckle because that will generate another break. So we harvest to, in such a way to set up a, a pattern of breaks with our roses. Now, spring plants, we can do that. If, if the plant's really, really growing hard, we can do that to shut them down a little bit, just above the knuckle. But in the winter months, we need to leave leaves leaves on the plant to generate that next shoot. So what, pruning is different than harvest and budding in that pruning, we're doing that to reduce the plant height and to take out the blind wood and stimulate bottom branches. And we typically do our pruning, uh, like we call summer, summer prune back in a carnation. We do the pruning uh, typically in late spring after Mother's Day. Uh, some people will wait till after what's called Decoration Day. Anybody know what Decoration Day is? No Southerners in the room? You call it Memorial Day. In the Southeast, it's called Decoration Day, the day that you go and decorate your, uh, the gravestones of your loved ones, specifically uh, those who were military, okay? Decoration Day, uh, actually started in Columbus, Mississippi. And it was right after the Civil War and a woman's auxiliary group decided to go through the cemetery and decorate the tombstones of the Southern soldiers and the Northern soldiers. So that's why it's called Decoration Day in the South. A new tactic that's probably been around not for much more than about 20 years is called bending or arching. And this is a tactic where um, we're not taking the blind shoots and cutting them out. We're taking the blind shoots and bending them over and snapping them part way through. Okay. Now what that does is we bend them down and let them snap, but we're not breaking them off. We're not cutting them off. We're snapping it and they were holding and we're pinching it down and it's kind of hard to see but you can see where these have been bent down and snapped and what it does is the photosynthates that are being generated by the foliage that's left is trapped it's trapped in that stem for lack of a better term then what it does is then it stimulates really strong branches off of that broken stem now this does a couple things. It generates really, really strong reproductive growth, lots of vegetation material, lots of foliage, so it's a nightmare to control insects, and 
but it does get all the crop down to the ground to the waist high so we don't have to put our workers on stilts. So there's worker safety, stronger stem, more vigorous production, but it's very difficult to spray for insects. Typically what they'll do for mite con spider mite control is they'll actually drive their, pull their stray spray boom on a pair of wheels and spray directly up is how they'll spray the crop. Um, increases a lot of air movement, light penetration, stronger uh, flowering shoot and stronger plant vigor, and so forth. I have placed in the RAM CT a article written by Dr. Heiner Leith at University of California, Davis. He is the uh, rose guru in the United States. Um, and he's written a very nice article on rose bending and arching, and I've put it in your reading assignment. Scheduling, we do our crop time for holidays and, and events because that's when we get our best value. Uh, pinching is how we use it to time it. It's eight weeks from pinch to harvest. So if your Valentine's crop, if, you're, if your Valentine's, your wholesaler needs your, your Valentine's flowers, they probably need them by uh, the end of January. You step back eight weeks, which is the first of December. So if you're going for a Valentine's crop, you're not going to be harvesting a crop for uh, Christmas, but you might be staging it. We can use water and temperature, mostly temperature, to fine tune it. And we do our cutback or our summer pruning um, after Mother's Day, oftentimes cutting it back as far as two to three feet above ground and start your pinching practices all over again. Physiological disorders we have in roses include blind shoots, um, not enough light, not enough shoot elongation, tip burn. This happens when it's cloudy. Uh, however, a lot of people will leave that tip burn um, petal on the plant to protect the rose during shipping because the typical florist always removes the guard petals, that first row of petals, uh, on their roses. Bullheads, um, flat, dark, 